Today's lecture is about amphibians. Now, amphibians can be used to illustrate another innovation that life takes on its evolutionary tree. And that is, on the branch that amphibians sprout off of fishes, you have the evolution of forms that move on to land. And so this is where you find the origin of tetrapods, that is four-limbed animals, walking around on land. And so this lecture will be about the challenges that amphibians encounter when they make it onto land, how they deal with those challenges from an evolutionary and trait perspective, and then something about the diversity of amphibian life. This is where we are in the evolutionary tree now, and we've been working with the coelocanths, Actinistia, and Dipnoia, the lungfishes, in the last lecture, as the groups that we were finishing with. And so that makes a logical place to start. You can see that in this group that includes all of the tetrapods that we're going to be talking about next, as well as coelocanths and lungfishes, you have the evolution of lobed fins. These lobed fins then become the origins of our own limbs. So we're going to start with them and just go back to some reminders about how cool the story is about coelocanths. And so I introduced this story briefly to you in the last lecture, but I just want to spend a little bit more time with it because it's super, super cool. And the cool part of it is, is that they were thought to be extinct for 65 million years. Nobody had seen a coelocanth, a living coelocanth, for 65 million years. And there was a woman who worked at a small museum in South Africa, Marjorie Courtney Latimer, uh, and there she is there. And she had the habit of going and getting fish for her fish collection from the trawlers who came to shore, uh, who'd been trawling off of the coast of South Africa, the east coast of South Africa. And it was Christmas Eve, and she got a call that the trawlers were there, and she thought, well, you know, it's, it's Christmas Eve, I don't really want to go, but I should go and wish these nice guys uh, um, a Merry Christmas because they've been so helpful to me. So she went and she was looking around and saw there were a bunch of sharks and things there and they weren't that interesting and she saw a little blue fin sticking out from underneath the pile. She removed it and saw this very strange looking fish and you can see her drawing of it in the lower left right there. Now when she looked at this she had this sneaking suspicion that it looked a hell of a lot like coelocanths that had gone extinct 65 million years ago. She wasn't that confident in completing the identification herself, so she contacted James L.B. Smith, who was a professor at one of the universities in South Africa. And he couldn't make it in time to see this particular coelocanth, but her drawing and note that she sent to him made him convinced that it was indeed a coelocanth. And then, equal weird sort of happenstance, there was a, um, a biologist, uh, his honeymoon in Indonesia, and he was at the fish market, and he saw a coelocanth there. That was in 1998, and uh, indeed it uh, has been shown genetically that it almost certainly must be a separate species. So lurking deep down in the ocean, it turns out that coelocanths had been there all along. And it's just that we don't usually have, we just don't usually contact them underwater, so we don't realize that they're there. But now with modern deep diving techniques, there are a lot of really cool videos of coelocanths and how they live their lives underwater. Now the really key thing, to, cool thing to look at is that fin right there because you can see there's going to be a bone that extends into that fin itself and then that is the origins in the ancestors to them and uh, lungfish of the four limbs that we have where the bones extend from the girdles into our arms. The other uh, species is the lungfish, the dipnoi or the dipnoa and there are six species of these. They're found in Africa, South Africa, uh, South America and also in Australia. They look quite different in the different places and they have a lot of weird behaviors including this similar behavior where they kind of do this sort of walking movement with their limbs which is reminiscent of the types of movement that amphibians do when they get out on land. They also uh, breathe through gills but they have primitive lungs and through these lungs they can actually respire. So this ap appears to be similar to the origin of the lungs that we now have. Now another cool thing about them is that they estivate, which is basically sort of go to sleep and have minimal activity uh, when it dries out in droughts and they just go into the mud and make themselves a little case and then they hang out there for six months or more until they can come out and when the rains come back they hydrate again and then they emerge and go about living their lives again. Now 
These fins then become the limbs of tetrapods, which are four-limbed animals. And those tetrapods, the first branching that I'm going to talk to you about is the amphibians, which include Anura, the frogs and toads, and Eurodella, the salamanders. As well as uh, another group I'm going to tell you about that's really cool. So imagine you went back 400 million years ago. If you did, there would be no vertebrate life on land. There would be no mammals, no birds, no reptiles, no amphibians. And there is, but there are lots of amphibian-like fishes in the water. And so you can imagine that maybe there's this huge open opportunity for fish in the water. How would evolution then generate the pressures that would cause them to move onto land? So in particular, during this time period, there appeared to have been a lot of droughts that generated these shallow inland seas, swamps, and ponds. And so you can imagine there'd be low dissolved oxygen that would make it beneficial to be near the surface of the water so that you can exchange more oxygen. There's much more oxygen in the air than there is in the water. And so as you're depleting the oxygen in the water in a swamp, being near the surface, there will be more air. So this would be one of the things that would bring organisms not out of the water yet, but closer to the surface of the water. There are other suggestions for reasons why it might have been beneficial to move out onto land. For instance, there might have been high competition in the water and therefore lower competition on land. So there might have been food out on land that they could see and start to go out after. Uh, and the, because of the crowding in these small pools. Also, there are a bunch of new food resources on land, such as arthropods and plants, which are out on land now. They preceded the vertebrate movement out onto land. So invertebrates got on land and plants got on land before the vertebrates. And there were no predators, no vertebrate predators anyway, uh, on land. So natural selection would favor the slow transition of lobe-thin fishes into something that goes out on land. And there are a lot of differences between life in the water versus life out on land. And so for the first part of this lecture, we're going to talk about some of those differences and how vertebrates, particularly through amphibians, have evolved to meet those challenges. So for example, there's obviously a lot less water and moisture out on land, which could be a problem, particularly during reproduction. The medium is much less dense though, so it won't hold you up. There's less buoyancy in, in water, you float, but on land you would fall down if you didn't hold yourself up. There's a lot more oxygen on land, so that's not like a difficulty, that's actually a potential opportunity where you can get out of low oxygen conditions in the water and get higher oxygen conditions out on land. But the temperature is much less stable, so you have much higher temperature fluctuations outside of the water than in the water. And then finally, there's a lot of UV radiation that is present out on land because UV is filtered out by water and UV can cause a lot of damage to DNA. And so it makes a lot of sense that you would have to deal with this additional selective force when moving out of water onto land. And here's just a quick comparison of forms of respiration. That is obtaining oxygen from the air or the water and releasing it, uh, releasing carbon dioxide. So in, uh, uh, crustaceans, you have internal gills, which you see in the upper right, uh, and then you have the trachea and uh, book lungs of invertebrates on the lower right, and then you have gills, external gills, in uh, salamanders, as we'll see in a minute. They still have gills, but they're external to the body. Uh, these are uh, aquatic salamanders. And then you have the evolution of lungs themselves. Now, if you remember from an earlier lecture, I talked about several of the vestiges that we have from our fishy ancestry. That is, our evolutionary origin in fishes can be seen in several aspects of our current anatomy. So here's another one. So if you can see, the lungs represented an original extension off of the gut, which means that the lungs and the gut were connected. And so we have that same system uh, in our throats, which is one of the reasons why we choke, because our food and our air have to end up going through the same pipe before they separate again. So that's one of the other unfortunate aspects of our fishy ancestry that um, we still bear with us today. Okay, so here's returning to some of those um, theoretical or potential problems that organisms will have when they move out of the water and onto land. And we're gonna go through some of these. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you need to maintain access to water to prevent desiccation. So you need to stay moist, otherwise you'll dry out and, uh, and die. And this will be much more important for fertilization and larval development and uh, the maintenance and the development of eggs. 
Also, as I said, air is less dense than water, and so now we're going to require supports to hold ourselves up, because if we didn't have this muscles and bones that were holding us off the ground and fighting gravity, then we would just turn into a pile of mush. This is then going to require more energy, which requires more oxygen coming in, which requires a better system for obtaining oxygen from the air and moving it about in the body. Also, I mentioned that air temperature was more variable, so your body temperature is going to fluctuate more and you're going to need to meet, meet, modify your behavior, physiology or anatomy in such a way as that you can maintain your temperature. And we'll particularly return to this uh, when we talk about thermal regulation in birds. Okay, so what are some of the tetrapod solutions to this? Well, the most logical thing is that you have to build a supportive structure that represents your skeleton. So it's a skeleton inside as opposed to the external skeleton of invertebrates. Now you have an internal skeleton that provides that structure with strong limbs, a vertebral column, and ribs coming off them like we discussed in the previous lecture. What did organisms look like when they made this transition? I've alluded to the fact that they would look like amphibian, like lobe-finned fishes coming out of the water and then evolving from there. Well, we have part of our understanding of how this process worked by looking at lobe-finned fishes, both extant ones, but also uh, fossil ones. And I previously mentioned Tiktaalik, which was discovered in Nunavut in Canada, and uh, forms a basis for a lot of the discussion in the book Your Inner Fish, uh, and which I recommended to you. And I also previously showed a video of you getting it out, uh, of it getting out on land and walking about, and so uh, we can watch that video again quickly. The shallows, the bones and joints would help to push itself up and punt around. But this new limb didn't just help mobility in the water. It became the driving force behind one of the most spectacular events in evolutionary history. The arrival of the first vertebrate animals on land. Now, Tiktaalik is probably not the actual ancestor to tetrapods, but maybe reflect one of the group that ended up generating the ancestor to tetrapods. And so here are some of the other lobe-finned fishes and amphibious tetrapods that the fossil record has revealed to us with the, uh, their age along this uh, from left to right. Uh, and then uh, from the, the bottom to the top, you see the increasing extent of movement onto land. Now, it's not sure exactly which of those were the ancestor to tetrapods, uh, and maybe the fossil hasn't been found yet. Now you can see this transition from the lobe-finned fish and first the rape-finned fish into the vertebrate tetrapod limb uh, as you look through the evolutionary tree here from raid fin fishes on the bottom to the coelocanths and you can see the different bony elements in the fin there uh, and then up to eustenopteron, tiktaalik, acanthostega and up into humans. And you can see the homology that is the shared origin developmentally and evolutionarily of the different elements of the vertebrate limb. Okay, so now these early tetrapods have stronger limbs and girdles to support their limbs. They have a vertebral column and they have ribs. They also often, the early ones, had a tail that was used for balance, no longer for swimming. Although I suppose perhaps if they went back in the water, they would still use it for swimming, as we will see in marine iguanas. Uh, the lungs were the primary respiratory organ now, rather than gills, and they have um, internal and external nostrils. So they're not just breathing through the mouth, but uh, through the nose as well. So there's ichthyostega, and this is probably what the skeleton of ichthyostega would look like underneath the flesh. Here's a moment where I want to just mention some research that's done by uh, one of the other professors in the biology department and Red Path Museum at McGill University, and that's Professor Hans Larsen, who studied one of the other um, fishes, this is a raid fin fish, not a lobe fin fishes, not a lobe fin fish, but they thought that it had a similar structure to some elements of the fins that might reveal something about whether or not the physical movement out onto land would actually make them better at performing on land. So they raised two groups of these polypterous fishes. Uh, one out of the water, and they would miss them, and then one in the water, and then they measured their swimming, their walking performance on land. 
And so here's a video that shows um, one of these uh, bikers or polypterists that is walking about on land. Remember again, that was not a Sarcopterygian and not certainly a model for the actual evolution of vertebrate life on land. Rather just a, a way of studying how the process of training to walk around on land would improve your performance on land. Okay, so now you're moving around a, around a bunch on land, you've got a skeleton to hold you up to fight gravity, uh, and you've got muscles that are moving you around and holding you up uh, attached, to the, attached to your skeleton. But that's very energetically expensive, you can't just float in the water, and so you need to bring more oxygen in and move it about the body. And so here we will return to the circulatory system and the heart, remembering the simple one that I talked to you about fishes. So this was the fish uh, single circuit that I showed you before with one ventricle and one atrium with the blood being accelerated into the gills and then diffusing passively to the rest of the body. You're not generating more pressure in the blood that's coming from the gills to the rest of the body. This is what the amphibian heart looks like now. So now you have a three chambered heart where you have blood that is oxygenated in either the lungs or the skin. So a lot of amphibians, particularly those that remain in mo very moist environments, can respire through their skin. Some don't even have lungs, they just respire through the skin. So that then moves back to the heart and is then pumped through a systemic circuit. Now the difference, of course, uh, between this system and more complex systems that we'll see later, including our own, is that here you have a three-chambered heart where in the ventricle, blood from the two circuits is mixing, which means that you can certainly create higher blood pressure to pump now both to the lungs or the skin, but also to the body. But at the same time, those two blood roots, uh, the deoxygenated blood from the body and oxygenated blood from the lungs are now mixing in the heart, which means that you're not fully saturating the blood that you're uh, pushing into the rest of the body and you're not fully desaturating the blood that is going to the lungs. You've got a more efficient system now for moving blood around the body, uh, but you also need to have a more efficient system for getting oxygen to that blood. Now, gills certainly work well when you're in water, but now you're out on land and so you need a different system. And so here I just want to talk about mechanisms of breathing in and out of the lungs, because you've got lungs in your body, but you need to get the air in and you need to get the carbon dioxide out. And so the way this works is different from us than from something like an amphibian. So we're going to talk about this with respect to Boyle's Law, which simply states that as the volume of something goes up, the pressure in it goes down. And so as a result, the gas will move from the high pressure area into the low pressure area. So that's basically what happens uh, with the lungs, where you have a diaphragm in humans and mammals, where when the diaphragm is contracted, it's pulled down. That expands the volume of the lungs, which sucks air in through the mouth and nostrils. So then what happens if you want to get the air out is you relax the diaphragm, it contracts up, increases pressure in the lungs. So the air pressure in the lungs is now greater than the outside, which causes the air to move out. That is called negative pressure breathing because you're creating negative pressure that then sucks the air in. Amphibians, by contrast, use this positive pressure breathing where inhalation is a two-stroke process. First, they bring uh, air into their nostrils and while they close their mouth and their glottis go back into their lungs. They pull air into their mouth and then they squeeze their mouth shut and force it into their lungs uh, with having their nostrils closed. So they bring it into their nostrils, close their nostrils, squeeze it from their mouth into their lungs. 